you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. John Olson is the creator and author of the Stranger Bridgerland books that will send shivers down your spine. His books delve into the mysterious worlds of ghosts, cryptids, UFOs, and much, much more. His latest book in the series, Stranger World, sees John publish first-hand accounts from around the world for the first time. John joins me to discuss a handful of the encounters included in this latest book of his brilliant series. But before that, as always, don't forget you can support Mysteries and Monsters by signing up at patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. $4 a month gets you ad-free episodes, guaranteed early releases, bonus content, and more. Thank you to Ursa, my latest patron, and thank you to each and every one of you that continue to support myself and the show with your donations. Thank you so much. We're also on Apple Podcasts, when Apple can be decided to fix it. So make sure you check the link in the show notes as well for that. Mysteries and Monsters is across all social media platforms. Please subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube. And don't forget, you can visit mysteriesandmonsters.com for episodes, news and merchandise. Thank you as always to Dean Bestel for his wonderful artwork. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys. Thank you as always for the marvellous Weary Pines for providing my wonderful intro and outro music and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. Haunted students, ghostly cars, cryptids, and some critical ghosts. These are all part of John Olson's Stranger World. For the last eight years, author John Olson has built a reputation as an author and researcher with his fantastic Stranger Bridgeland series of books. With his seventh volume, Stranger World hitting number one on several Amazon charts. It's a long overdue debut on Mysteries and Monsters. John, welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. It's uh, it's great to be here. I love your podcast. You do such an amazing job. Thank you for having me on. Oh, well, with with comments like that, John, you're always welcome to come back straight away. That's it. (laughs) (laughs) So, John, you're you're, uh, a, a lover of all things weird and wonderful covering a a, a wide range of topics as you've shown over your uh, series of books over the years i'm one of those people i i'm aware of where you grew up cash valley not for anything particularly paranormal um because obviously i love strange things and i have a thing about weird animal stories and and crazy things and obviously where you grew up is is how i got to know where it was is all down to this wonderful story of old Ephraim, the the giant bear, the last grizzly shot in Utah. Um, so I I just the, the, that area that you grew up in is is one of those places that ten years ago I didn't know the first thing about, and now I just think it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. Oh well, thank you. And and right now when the the leaves are changing color and it's cooling down, it it's just gorgeous. I love it. Um, and thank you. It's yeah. Um. I grew up with those stories about old Ephraim and the, you know, the grizzly bear and and hearing all these those stories and just, I mean, that was that's not a paranormal story, but when you hear about how big the bear was and what went on between him and that um, that sheep herder, it's it's it almost seems paranormal with with what he was able to do this this big bear but yeah it's it's a beautiful place to live and i grew up here and haven't been able to get away because i just can't find any place more beautiful so <laughs> exactly when you've got something like that in your doorstep why go anywhere else john yeah exactly <laughs> travel the world but you've got home to come home to uh, well exactly and, and uh, one of the the things about yourself is obviously as, as you refer to in in a lot of your books and i know you've done interviews you're one of what you're one of our gang john you grew up in a haunted house with a with a paranormal lodger and i'm i'm interested to see that do you i know you've mentioned it that obviously the events and the interactions seem to spike when your dad started doing some renovations so was it was it just um 
a, a, a general thing that was was in the home prior to that, and then the the events escalated once you started redecorating in the house. Yeah, you know, it was always kind of there, um, always in the background, and it was it was strange because you would go months without anything, and then it would go a couple weeks where it was very crazy, you know, with with all different kinds of paranormal paranormal things going on, but. Whenever we did any renovation, which, you know, the, the house was built in 1883, so it was very, it's very old. So, you know, a lot of things had to be done with it through the years. And I helped my dad do a lot of the renovations. And when we did that, it definitely seemed to stir it up almost like a hornet, hornet's nest of, of activities that would, you know, start out because of it. So it definitely helped bring up the energy when, when we did different things like that. Mm. So, I know you've mentioned in the past you you had a hat man. Was was the hat man there before this started or was he one of the new sort of escalations that were brought on by the the renovation? Um you know he was he was always there. Um when I remember the first time I uh, saw him the full body apparition uh, I was in about 8th grade I'd come home from school and my mother, who was a stay-at-home mom, but she was gone running errands, so I was the first one home. I grabbed a sandwich and went to the front room. And as I sat down, um, there was some movement that caught my attention before I could turn the TV on. And I saw him he was standing there, and I could see through him, but uh, tall, skinny, with um, a white shirt and overalls. Very much what a farmer would wear, an and old-time farmer. And he came in and sat down across from me in the rocking chair, started rocking back and forth. And I closed my eyes and counted to ten. And when I opened them, he was gone, but the chair was still rocked. So I jumped up and ran out. <laughs> and I remember that's the first time that I saw him in full, you know. And uh, but he didn't, you know, he always I, I, I he's not the only ghost, I believe, in the house for sure. Mm -hmm. But he's definitely the most vocal. And he, he did um, when we did renovations and we changed things because I, I believe he's the house. Um, later on, I was able to find out that um, through seems that it was actually a great, great uncle who owned it in the 20s. And that's who that is. And he is just very attached to that. Of course, you know, changing things make him very upset about it because it's probably the way he loved it. And then you see people change it. It uh, would upset you. Yeah. So it's it's a paranormal vote of no confidence in the renovation, it would seem then, John. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Even on the other side, people are still critics, John, and they can't help themselves, can they? No, they can't uh, at all. So <laughs> I think we're that you know we get stuck in our ways here, and I'm sure on the other side we're still stuck in our ways. So, <laughs> so did this obviously set a um, uh, uh, a fire under your bushel in regards to creating a love of the paranormal and the strange, John? That you were eager to sort of try and find out about local hauntings in your area or was this something where you would tell people about your experiences and they would share them and that's where your interest sort of developed as you as you grew well it was interesting because when i was very little um parents you know they would they did us talking about it at all because um uh, grew up in is a very small town it's grown since obviously but um you know the biggest fear back then is having people talk about you and if people heard that our house was haunted or that we thought it was haunted my parents were very afraid of us being talked about so we were not allowed at all and as i got older i had friends that would come visit the house and they had experiences in the house and then i had to finally say you know admit yeah my house is haunted but in the meantime when you know i wasn't to talk about it i i everything i could it piqued my interest about the paranormal and i just I just dove in and just learned everything that I possibly could about the paranormal. And then as I got older and was able to tell my stories, people started bringing their stories to me because they felt safe. And so by the time I was 17 or 18, I was collecting stories and, and, and getting the local story from, you know, people bringing me their stories to uh, me hearing about a story and hunt, having to hunt down the person that it happened to so I could get it first person. 
grew from there. And then after my first book, which I published eight years ago, thanks to my lovely wife who helped me, um, mm -hmm. then it kind of grew. And then I started getting stories from further away and further away and further away. So uh, have you um, have you tried to test the uh, the legend of the weeping woman? Because I know in your local area, you've got a famous graveyard ghost, haven't you? Yes. Um the weeping woman up there. I have not personally. I've wanted to, and I just haven't yet. But I have. Yeah, I've had done that. It's a a statue in Logan Cemetery, um, and it's uh, from a woman. First name, but the last name is Lillinquist. Where near the 1900s, right around the 1900s, she lost four out of her five children. And when she passed away, her husband built this statue um, at her grave site, and it's her bent over with you know covering her. Eyes. She was. Very heartbroken um, folklore around it is if you're around the statue at night and ask her where her children are, tears in its in its eyes. And I have talked to people who've done it and they've gotten very creeped out doing that for sure <laughs> and had various different experiences at the Weeping Woman. Mm. And to be fair, as, as graveyard ghosts and uh, graves, especially because there are several in the in the US, especially in the northern states where there are certain monuments built to uh, the departed that this one seems a, a little bit less full-on than some of the others john there's there's no kind of if you touch it or see it cry you're going to pass on whereas some of the other ones there is always this fear of death that may appear that may occur <laughs> on some occasions so i'm not really is it do you think it's it's quite a a, a, a more of a sensitive graveyard ghost than some of the other ones yeah i think so i think that the uh, the, the spirit attached to it, really, you know, upset and 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 that's where it comes from. And and yeah, from what I understand, there's no um, negative connotation attached to it for if you if you did or anything like that. But uh, it's definitely creepy. I mean, to be able to they stand there and, and hear and, you know, see the tears and um, it's uh, it is definitely creepy. But like you say, there's a lot of different ones out there. Um, associated that that are supposedly deadly. I know back east there's quite a few cemeteries with um, benches that are you know they're supposed to be there to for the mourners, but certain ones you're not allowed to sit in because bad luck follows. So it's uh, it can get really creepy for sure. Mm. So as you started with this first book, John, and and sort of as as. All the great researchers will always say, always start on your doorstep and, and, and develop from there. Is it sometimes surprising that people have, have sort of congregated to your spooky sort of origin stories in your locality? And it's it sort of spread its way out like a web. It's almost as if you're pulling the rest of the states and obviously the, the most later book, you latest book. You've got some international stories in there for the first time, I believe. Is it is it still surprising that there is this real thirst for these stories or is it do you think i mean i've always been very impressed with the way that you you write about people's experiences you're you're very sort of straightforward and 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 it would seem to me as 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 a reader of your work john you you're very honest and supportive of the people that share these experiences with you do you think that's one of the reasons that people want to speak with you because they know that they're going to be treated with an open mind definitely and especially with my background having dealt with paranormal things as a child and forward i, I think people feel safe um sharing their stories with me and and that there won't be any judgment uh it was interesting not long ago i interviewed a woman and she stopped right in the middle of her story and she goes she goes and she got really emotional and i'm like are you okay are, are you okay to continue and and she said i'm just really overwhelmed because i've never gotten this far in my story without somebody calling me crazy and it really wasn't mm. even that crazy of a story and i said oh no i said and she goes and you you i can't believe that you i found somebody that actually believes me and i said well of course you know and and she was able to continue but it was very emotional for her and i could i could feel that for sure and and just her her shock in finding somebody that would listen to her story and and believe her, which it, it's it makes me feel good that I can help people that way. And I, I hope that my books do that as well. Um, they're there for fun and for people to read and to get scared at night. But it's also there to reach out for those that have had experiences and and so they don't feel alone as well. Mm. I think that's one of the most 
underestimated parts of the paranormal, John, that, you know, for people like us who, who talk about strange and spooky things day in, day out, I think sometimes we underestimate what goes on in the real world, where, as you mentioned about your, your parents growing up, they didn't want you talking about your haunted house because they didn't want people pointing at you as you, you, know, you did your weekly shopping or whatever. Um, and I, it, I, I suppose it, we, we sometimes are still surprised that people would have that kind of response that when they speak to, to people such as ourselves, we're the first person that's, that's listened to them properly, which... I think we often over, well, not ourselves, John, because obviously with your experience, this is probably something that happens more often than not. But I think sometimes people can be quite surprised that they, when a witness speaks to, to someone and, and is able to unbridle themselves of their experiences in a, in an open way, that they, they do feel an overriding sense of relief that somebody's actually listening for once. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, when you have an experience too, um, where, you know, it's just so emotional where, as you know, some paranormal experiences can just be overwhelming and that need to be able to share, but then the fear of being judged and just to have a place where you can, um, express it or even see it, you know, in book form. And, you know, I always give everybody the option to as well to change uh, their name, which some people take advantage of, some people are fine with, but I think it's just validation for them to see it written as well. They're like, well, you know, there's my story. It's documented. And, um, you know, it, it almost feels like a burden of a relief off of their shoulders now. I suppose, John, there comes a point when you, you do the work that you do, we can kind of be quite blasé about it. I mean, sometimes I can be, you know, oh, well, I've heard I've heard everything. Or the, I'm sort of consider myself well versed in, in paranormal encounters and strange experiences that people would have. But then somebody I'll hear a story or somebody will t tell me something. And I would imagine it's the same for you, that you will always end up being shocked sometimes, I would imagine, or even a little frightened by some of the experiences. Was that something that happened to you when you were building the first book? Or is it something that as it's gone on there you are still surprised that you can hear an encounter or a, an experience that is essentially quite frightening even for people such as ourselves yeah um the, it definitely happens and one thing that happened well it's happened several times to me in in writing these books is i will meet somebody who will give me a story and it's a very uh, you know it's to me it seems different like than anything I've heard before. And um, I've had, you know, three different I, types of stories that would fall under this category where I felt like it was a one-off really good story, but then I put it in the book and then people just come out of the woodwork where they're like, oh my goodness, I thought I was the only one that that had happened to, or I, you know, this happened to me and I, I didn't realize that it had happened to somebody else. And I'll, I'll give you a couple examples of that. Um, I had a story in one of my first books it was called Not My Cousin. Yeah. Yeah, where this young – well, he's adult now, but when he was a boy and they were camping, basically uh, something had mimicked his cousin that he looked up to, drawing him away from the camp to try and get him up into the woods. And when he got back, you know, he got scared and ran back only to find that his cousin never left camp. And so I wrote, you know, the first one, and I thought, wow, that it's a very creepy, strange story. But, you know, the number of people that contacted me after that book to say, you know, this very same thing happened to me, um, something mimicking uh, either a cousin or an older sibling or somebody that I looked up to, to try and draw me off into the woods or into an abandoned building. And so it became this this thing that, that scared me to think that there's something out there trying to draw, you know, people away into abandoned places by mimicking someone that they know and love or trust. And so it's it's kind of crazy. And the same kind of thing happened with um, the black eyed kids as well. I, I got my first black eyed kid story and it was a local one as well. And just the number of people that contacted me locally that had had experiences with them kind of shocked me <laughs> that uh, there were so many stories of that. So it can definitely happen and, and still give me creeps to the day, you know, thinking of of the things that are out there that 
that could be harmful and and definitely scary. Mm. Well, I think as well, it, it, it sort of calls back to what you were saying about putting certain stories in the book and then people contact you. I think for a lot of these, there are certain stories like Black Eyed Children or these sort of mimics or whatever, doppelgangers or voigas or whatever they are that seem to be enticing people. And then you look at the wider, the wider pantheon of, of events that are going on and you have the stories of the numerous amounts of people disappearing in certain parts of the world in, in like sort of hot spots of disappearances and strange occurrences. And it begins to think that how long has this been going on? Is it only sort of by authors such as yourself or perhaps Jim Harold's campfire is another great example of people sharing really strange experiences. And, and one of the shows I do, the ghost story guys, we get some very odd stories from all around the world, which is even I'm sort of taken aback sometimes. Do you think they've always been happening? And it's only now sort of over the last 25 years as we've all become a little bit closer through being connected through the Internet that more and more people are able to say, actually, that's happened to me. Yeah, I think that a lot of those go back as far as far back as we can actually document, because what's very interesting thing is, you know, I'm always looking at like you, I'm always reading and listening to podcasts and and read, you know, watching shows and all of this. And I came across a show that I hadn't seen before and they were in Alaska and they were talking about this very same thing where something will mimic a family member to draw you into the wilderness. And then it's been going on so long that the 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 native um the native people in alaska have a name for it and i wish i could remember what it was um but so it's far enough back in their culture that you know they have a name for it and they have a way for the kids to watch out for it and i kind of fell out of my chair when i was watching that because you know it, it connected so well with all the stories of of the people that i have talked to so i think that there's whatever it is has been here a long time. And, you know, you talked about um, the missing people and the missing 411, which, you know, I love those books as well. And mm. um, Dave Politis, as he's, you know, done this as far back as he can find as well in newspapers all, all the way back to, you know, 1800s, you have these missing people. So whatever it is, has been here a very long time, I believe, probably back before written language for sure. Yeah. I think sometimes you can and there are some stories in in that ilk of of people just vanishing or being it it sort of harks back and I know you've mentioned this on some of your previous interviews on other shows when we talk about these kind of things John that is it just that you know that things like the fae are still with us and and because obviously there's a lot of sort of experiences in regards to being fairy led and then some researchers would say well that's because now this has kind of developed into the ufo abduction situation until you start looking that people are still seeing fairies people are still being fairy led people are still being called into the woods by strange voices that sound like friends or family yeah for sure and you know there's definitely I, I would I don't know if you'd call it shocked, but but really rang true with the number of people who do have encounters still with the fate or fairies or these creatures. And because um, when I very first started, you know, I, I stories and, and, and before I talked to individuals that had, you know, had firsthand accounts of them. I, I even put them kind of on the back burner as well. That's just folklore or explaining, you know, mm -hmm. this or that. But. But now I'm uh, now with the number of people that I've interviewed and everything that I've read, you know, there's it's it's fascinating that the Fae are still there and that, you know, a lot of people will say, well, you know, the, the UFO people who focus on UFOs are like, well, it was always UFOs and pe that's how they just explained it. But I, I really think that they're two separate things, um, at least my belief after all the studying I've done, that there is definitely the Fae and then also whatever the UFO and um, abduction on that side is also something. But they're as far as i can tell not connected if it makes sense yeah 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 i, I i'm i'm with you as well john if you do and, and i've said this before when i've when i've done a couple of shows on on the fae uh, and um i just like to say that i respect their beliefs and whoever they are and wherever they are i do respect them <laughs> <laughs> yes, some people of get to, some people do do not want to talk about the the fae in any form i have to say i if you'd have asked me five years ago before i started doing the show 
what I thought about the Fae and what I think now. I'm very much in, in your train of thought there, John. I, I just thought it was folklore. I didn't think there was anything in in any kind of way that would relate to a modern encounter. And I'm completely wrong. Absolutely wrong. There are thousands of people that are having these experiences still. It's it's incredible, really. And it just makes you think, as we were saying about how things have developed over the last 20, 25 years and people being able to share their experiences. These were always going on, but the the modern cynicism of, of, of science and um, the attitude that we've, we, we're, a, we're a more learned society, and some would scoff at that anyway, John, depending where you live in the world, <laughs> that this was all folklore and superstition and, and uneducated people who just didn't understand the way the world is. Well, that's clearly not the case anymore, is it? No, definitely not. And, you know, I, I, you know, I love science, you know, and I understand where science is coming from, but to mm -hmm. believe that the be all end all of science is what we know right now would be just, I think that would be just crazy because it's amazing just how quickly we learn something new that we didn't understand before with science, you know? And I think that not necessarily that, you know, paranormal is ahead of science, but I believe that, you know, if you, if you just dismiss it because it's not rooted in what you believe is science, then you're missing, you know, the whole a bigger picture, I guess you could say. Absolutely. One only has to look at what people thought dinosaurs looked like 200 years ago, John, to what they look like now and the fact they're covered in feathers to show that, yes, you, should, you shouldn't just pretend that we know everything at any particular given moment in time. Yes, that is very true. Very true. <laughs> Well, the latest book that you've released, John, that, as we said, your, your seventh over the last eight years, you're extremely <laughs> prolific, continuing to collate these stories. And I, what I like about this latest book is you, you kind of ease us in because the, the first story isn't particularly frightening, though clearly Adam, who's your, <laughs> who's the witness that shared this with you, was, was clearly quite terrified. And it's one of those classic, oh, it's it, it can't be what, what's going on it must be something else we'll just disregard it even though adam's clearly having a really crap weekend <laughs> dealing with whatever's in this spare room yes exactly um yeah so it was really good to get get adam's story and it was from quite a while ago i mean he's um all you know an adult now and he contacted me and was telling me this story about when he had graduated good friends whose name was Steve, um, had graduated a year before him, and Steve had gone on to Alabama, Birmingham, and he really wanted Adam to join him there. So uh, the summer after graduation, he invited him out to come and look and, you know, tour. And so he went out to spend three or four days with Steve. Steve lived off campus and in a little bit older home. And he did, Adam came to, you know, visit. And originally, he was going to stay on the floor of Steve's room. But when he got there, Steve was like, oh, our third roommate just up and left in the middle of the night. <laughs> that room is, is free for you, which to me, that would be the first, you know, indicator of, you know, something spooky going on. Yeah. Paranormal alarm. Um, Adam didn't seem already, to John. too bothered. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> so, you know, the first night uh, he was, he was uh, asleep, laying in bed. Uh, it was just a mattress um, in the room in an old nightstand with a, a mirror was all that was in there. So, well, and, you know, the first thing that happened was uh, he put his stuff in there and locked it. And they went and did stuff and came back. And his stuff had been dumped out on the floor all over the place. And, you know, they couldn't figure out how that was because the door was locked and the window was shut. But... He kind of just brushed it off and cleaned up, and then when he went to bed, and around three o'clock in the morning, he something just pushed him, shoved him directly out of bed and onto the floor, and he woke up confused, looking around, nobody's there, and it, it took him a while to get back to sleep. He thought, well, maybe I fell out of bed, maybe you know something weird. I, you know, he tried to brush it off, and um, I believe. I believe it was that next morning. Um, he was out early, and he could hear footsteps um, above them, but there wasn't, there isn't anything but an attic above them. And but it was very heavy boot steps. And when they you know, went to look, when his friend got up, nobody was up there. Nothing 
And uh, that next day, they just kind of went around town and then did the college thing they, and drank and partied till the wee hours <laughs> came back. That night, nothing happened. But, you know, when he was telling me this story, it was so out of it drunk. Anything could have happened. I would have never heard it anyway. That <laughs> And uh, the third day, they just spent recovering and, and playing video games. But what really happened that was crazy was that night um, he'd gone to bed and he felt like and, and yank him and – um, you know, he woke up and trying to figure out what's going on. And with the light coming in from the window inside of this big mirror that this old man um, had a gray jacket and messy salt and a really dirty beard. And he's inside the mirror, which is really kind of <laughs> crazy to begin with. But and he's basically telling him, you know, mouthing the words, get out, you know, out. And so jumps up, obviously leaves, goes out in the front room. He but doesn't want to wake anybody up, so he just you know, turns on all the lights and walk until the morning, and then tries to explain to his friend what had happened. And they were all kind of weirded out. And he, I think he was supposed to say one more day, but he left, which I obviously would too as well. <laughs> but um, and he did not end up. But uh, yeah, it was. It's one of those encounters where obviously had a run in with somebody who had lived there before, really upset about what it was he was in that room or, or what that was obviously, you know, looking back, the reason the date had left abruptly in the middle of the night. So mm. it, it still astounds me how some people can just brush off very strange occurrences as, oh, uh, well, that's a bit strange, but never mind. We'll move on. You know, like you say, if somebody <laughs> if somebody's been there a few days and they go, oh, well, here's the rent for the rest of the year. Thanks a lot. I'm off. And they go, oh, well, that's a yeah. shame. You, you know, <laughs> you begin to scratch your head. I, I had to chuckle because, like you say, you can you can you can age this story because they're all playing on a PlayStation One. <laughs> so you know it's at least twenty years old. <laughs> right, exactly. Which... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Takes me back to my younger days, wasted time when, on the yeah. PS One. <laughs> but it's uh, <laughs> me like too. When you, when... Me as well. <laughs> <laughs> when Adam sort of sat there and he's he's throwing his cereal in the air because he's that frightened because of these footsteps he can hear and they they can both hear them and he and his friend just like mm, that's strange check it there's nothing there it it's a do you think sometimes some people don't want to face up to the reality of what's going on because they just can't deal with it and because i don't understand how some people can just ignore things like that because if somebody's run out of the house after a week and you keep hearing footsteps running about and your friend comes to stay with you and tells you that there's a terrifying ghost in his room and they go oh well we'll, we'll stay. we're all right what's going on there yeah exactly and, and i i don't do with you know with his friend uh, with steve later on but um yeah he was i don't i don't know if he thought adam was just like you say he heard the footsteps so just kind of tell it really bites them in the face they they have a hard time understanding or realizing what's going on i guess mm, definitely definitely i was very interested as well to see one of the stories is the famous ghost car in your experience and, and through your history of, of doing the books, John, how many sort of celebrity encounters or, or ghosts of famous people or, or ghosts that can be prescribed to to famous people or tragic incidents, as, as the one in this latest book is, have you been sent? Is it something that is, is quite rare or... Well, this particular one is obviously in regards to James Dean, one of the, the world's biggest heartthrobs when he passed away in the 1950s. Is is this something that you've had a lot of over the years? You know, I, I have not got a lot of famous ones, no, um, up to this point. Uh, Ruben's story uh, was, I believe, one of my first that you could attribute to, uh, you know, a famous ghost. So that was another reason I was really excited to get it. Um, I actually had worked with Ruben for years, and then he contacted me, you know, a couple about a year ago and said, oh, you know, I, I never got to tell you my ghost story, uh, my famous ghost story. And so it was really kind of fun to get um, Ruben, you know, he, he lives here now, but, you know, he grew up in Santa Clara, California, and for many years he used to drive um truck so um delivering different things to different places in southern um southern california and he told me that one time 
in his story. It was about 3 a.m. is when he usually started uh, his drive, and he was driving on um, uh, I, F- I-5 is, is where this happens, which is out kind of in the desert part of uh, California out there, and uh, Highway 46. And he was driving, and not, not obviously not a lot of traffic that early in the morning. He's he's going to deliver different things, and he notices this these um, these headlights way back in the distance. And as he's going, they come up on him really fast, and it kept coming up on his bumper and then backing off and up and then backing off and wherever there was a place that he would slow down so that they could pass him, they wouldn't pass him. And so he was just kind of a little irritated that, you know, they obviously wanted to go faster but wouldn't pass him. And as he's approaching um, where, I guess, Highway 46 and Highway 41 um, is kind of a famous corner there, um, he's like, well, you know, they're going to probably turn here or if they don't, I'll stop and they can get around me. And just as he gets to the corner, the lights just disappear. And he looks and, you know, there's no way where where it is, is. It's just flat and kind of a little deserty. And they couldn't have turned and him not see it. And they couldn't have, you know, just stopped. And so he's a little, con- a little confused and a little concerned. And he goes on and finally, you know, he finishes his route and he's going around. And he stops at this gas station to get a drink and get some stuff near at the end of it, near the end of his shift, which is still, you know, fairly early in the day. And as he's, you know, sitting there, he can hear two old guys at the table just down from him at this little diner slash, you know, gas station. And the one is talking about how he just saw James Dean's car the other day. And he's like, James Dean died a long time ago, you know, and he's like, so he asked the guys what they were talking about. And they explained that, you know, on I-5, on Highway 46, at different times of night or early in the morning, uh, you'll have a car run up on you. And they kind of explained exactly what had happened to him. And he said, oh, well, that happened to me just this morning. And then the cars disappeared. And the old guy's like, oh, it disappeared at 46 and 41. And he's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, that was James Dean that was chasing you. He uh, that's where he crashed was right there. And so um, his the phantom lights will chase you up until that point where apparently he that's where he crashed and died. And so and the old guys were like, yeah, you got you got chased by a famous famous ghost car, basically. So <laughs> not real scary, but definitely kind of a cool story for sure. Yeah, I, th- there is a lot of strange things about that particular car as well, John. Um, yeah. I mean, it's got its own history after James Dean died because it, it, it essentially became re- revered and, and feared as a as a as an omen of death for anybody that owned it. There are so many stories. Um, I know there's a very famous one about somebody that was taken. They were taking it to an exhibition um, and it, it collapsed and fell on the person that had transported it. I know people that had had parts in it and had serious car crashes a few people died and then it vanished that I'm, I'm not sure if there's still a reward but i know if i don't know maybe 20 years ago there was a, a one million dollar reward for it because it's it's never been seen since about 1960 i think yeah it's it, it, it's amazing the story that you know that went on from it like you say even having parts from the car uh, that car can be deadly with the number of people who've um died who's been attached to that car and so yeah it's it it is it's really strange for sure and um it's it's amazing to me how many people or how many objects or something like that seem to have that bad luck attack to it um yeah i don't know if you know about uh the mummy utsi that they found in the past yes yes i i was amazed when i got into that and looked into it you know the number of people, you know, the person that found it, the, all the people who got it out, um, even the helicopter pilot that flew it out have all died under strange circumstances. And yes. so, yeah, there's a lot of things out there that kind of do the same kind of thing as that, as his car um, have some sort of curse attached to it. Yeah, I watched a documentary about that and I, I thought, oh, I'm just sitting because I'm 
like I say, I'm interested in history and things like that. And obviously, this this corpse had been in a glacier for a couple of thousand years or whatever. Um, and I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. I didn't expect it to turn into some kind of horror story halfway through this documentary. And they were saying, oh, yeah, well, Jim's dead now. And, and Steve, he fell off a mountain. And, and Brian, he fell into a, a washing machine. It was it was incredible. I was just like, what is going on here? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Oh. It was it was very strange. The number of people that that ha- associated to it has died. So it's uh, <laughs> spooky for sure. And once is you know odd, twice is a coincidence. So that many people is not <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think to be fair, anybody as we, you know with James Dean's car, quite why anybody wants to own a car that was nicknamed Little Bastard. I think he's kind of giving the game away, really. <laughs> John, I think you're right. asking for trouble owning a car and giving it a name like that. It's only going to end one way, sadly. Yeah, yep, for sure. It's uh, It kind of tells you right there in the name not to mess with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the, the, one of the oddest things about that whole thing, though, as well, is that Alec Guinness had uh, had a premonition of, of Dean's death, didn't he, beforehand, and said, if you if you own that car... You'll die in it. And he just laughed at him. And I think he passed away a week later. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Yep, they were good friends. And, and he tried to tell him that. Um, mm. So, yeah. And, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that because it, it just triggered a memory of mine. Um, when I was young, my dad, uh, he he wanted a motorcycle forever and ever and finally got the money saved up, I remember. And he had a guy that was selling him the motorcycle and he went and got it on the back of the truck and we're unloading it. I'm helping him unload it. And he says, he looks at me dead in the eyes and he says, if I keep this motorcycle, it's going to kill me. And I thought, well, that's weird. He's like, no, I just had a premonition of that. And we loaded, we loaded it back up and took it right back. (laughs) And no matter, you know, he wanted that motorcycle so bad, but he took it right back. And so, I, I, I do believe in premonitions for sure, but it's funny mm-hmm. that you mentioned that and then that memory jumps back to me. So, but wow. I know it's weird, but it is, especially like you say, if your dad was, it was his dream to own one. And then as soon as he owns one, he goes, oh, no, 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 I don't want this. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's wow. interesting. <laughs> I mean, one of the other great aspects of, of your, your books, John, is that you don't just as we're talking about creepy, creepy ghost stories, you you cover all kinds of phenomena. You get stories from everywhere. Um, I mean, are you still surprised when you get stories involving cryptids and UFOs? Because one of one of the next ones I want to touch on is obviously in regards to a, a, a Bigfoot bothering somebody. Mm-hmm. Are you are you one of those people that have have come to appreciate more about people's experiences meeting? hairy bipeds in North America, John, or were you someone that always thought there was a possibility of Bigfoot, or is it something that you've you've grown into thinking there's a lot more to this than than people just being told they're misidentifying a bear? Um, Bigfoot in particular, um, I have always loved from a kid um, reading stories, and I remember reading my very first book about uh, Sasquatch and Bigfoot and, and watching the really old um, In Search of that was about Bigfoot. In fact, I try and put that one about every couple months and watch it again just because of the nostalgia and everything from yes. the old Leonard Nimoy in search. Of, I love those. Um, yeah. So I've always I've always believed in when I was younger, I always believed and hoped there was a big there was Bigfoot out there. But I, you know, from all the people, you know, firsthand accounts that I've collected, I know there's definitely something out there. And that's on my list of things that you know, someday I really would love to see. And I spend a lot of time in the wilderness, too. And so I really hope to see someday with my own eyes, because I do believe there's something to it for sure. Yeah. Well, as I always say on this show, be careful what you wish for, John. <laughs> That's true, too. You always got to be careful <laughs> with that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm doing a, I'm doing an episode shortly about Ape Canyon. And if there's ever a uh, warning about be careful what you bump into, that's it. Yes, that one, <laughs> that one was definitely... That was definitely one of the more violent Bigfoot stories for sure. So, uh, well, this the story that I that I collected um, that I interviewed Andrea. Uh, her and her husband live in southern Idaho, and they're both retired. And because of that, they get to do some traveling and go around and see their kids. And um, 
there's a canyon. It's called West Side Canyon, and it travels um, basically between um, West Side area and over to a, a place called Malad. But it's kind of a cool little canyon that goes up through. And what's really interesting is there's a lot of things attached to this canyon, including skinwalker sightings and, you know, just some creepy things that are going on near that canyon. And she was telling me the story. Um, her and her husband wanted to go for a ride, so they drove up over over the canyon, over to Malad, and then, you know, got a drink. And then they were driving back just kind of like a, you know, a Sunday afternoon drive kind of a deal. But it was getting much – it was starting to get dark. And as they were going through the canyon, all of a sudden her husband slams on the brakes. And she was watching the hillside. And when she looked forward thinking, oh, that deer had jumped out in front of the car or something, she sees this this big, basically hairy guy – obviously a Sasquatch, and he kind of goes to walk across the road in front of them, and she, it was close enough, you know, that she could see, you know, details of the hair and the muscle, and as it turned, as it, it obviously was kind of a little shocked that they had come along at them too, because as it mm-hmm. walked in the road, it, it turned to look at the car, and she said that, that you know, stood out in her mind was that it had to turn, you know, it's almost its whole upper body to turn and looking to have much of a neck at all and just walked across the road and then was in there and gone. And um, she said it only took, it was so large, it only took two strides to get across the road. And they drove down to look and to see if they could see and they couldn't see any starting to get dark. And, um, but she was kind of, you know, the fact that they had seen us and they, you know, on their, their drive home, they're, we're not going to tell anybody about this. We're we're going to kind of keep it to ourselves. And they had done that. And I was the only person that they, they'd really told outside of their family. And I changed her name and, and everything like that so that they could keep their anonymity. But it was scary and fascinating. And, you know, I this was one of the only firsthand accounts that I had gotten. But um, I know of several um, times that the police in that area had been called um, something in that can basically and it had gotten complaints that that I, I don't know how you call the police and complain i've seen sasquatch but it had happened so <laughs> um i guess the idaho highway patrol right there and so um you know i know of at least three or four um instances where people had seen it and in this in that time span about six months and if if I know of at least four more out there of people who saw and didn't say anything, so it's uh, it's a very cool story too because it's not too far from me uh, right now. So and I've driven the canyon several times. So oh, you have no excuse then, John. Now you know you know where to go. No, I know exactly. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I've got a little map too um, where I've marked all of the local you know people that have seen um, Sasquatch, and so. Um, you know, I, I've got a good idea where I could go if I, you know, if I want to do an expedition, I suppose, if I can get maybe one to go with me. So who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as we were saying, as I, as I sort of churlishly mentioned, the amount of people that are told that they're, they're not seeing what they say they're seeing. Andrea's in, in her story to you, in her account to you, John, says she was about mm-hmm. 20 foot away. Now, yeah. I don't know about you, John, but unless Andrea is related to Mr. Magoo, I doubt that both her and her husband are going to misidentify a bear walking upright in two strides. Even even a bear couldn't walk, even if it was a bear. Yeah. They don't have that stride length nope. to be able to do that. And she's 20 foot yeah. away. She's clearly seeing a hairy man. Yes, exactly. And, you know, people that say that, and, I, and when I talk to them about it, I say, you know, bears can walk on their back legs, but the dimensions of a bear standing on its back legs, they have little tiny legs when they're were walking. It's very obvious that it's a bear when it's full feet. Um, and it, it I, especially like you say, at 20 feet, it would be awful hard to miss a bear um, from that far away. So and she she was very detailed about, you know, what she saw and, and the explanation and and the idea, too, and the fact that she to look at him it had to kind of turn its whole upper body because of 
not having that big of a neck to be able to see over its shoulders kind of a thing. So uh, the way he tells and everything just, you know, and, and of course, when I'm interviewing her as well, just hearing, you know, the excitement and fear and everything, because when people are explaining something like this, they're almost transported right back to the incident, you know, so it's uh, it's it's fascinating and fun to hear stories. Is it something that, as you say, when you have people that are sort of reliving these encounters, John, I know, as you were saying earlier on about the, the woman you were speaking with who, who, who got very emotional about it. Do you have you found that some people really suddenly feel very uneasy talking about it because it's it's taking them back and all of a sudden they can remember those emotions that they they had at that point regardless of whether it's a ghost or a cryptid or strange lights in the sky yeah definitely um it's 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 very interesting when you're interviewing people because you know you know emotions and and personalities are all different. So are the way people tell their stories. And some people are able to attack, you know, detach themselves, to kind of explain it almost as a, uh, almost as a crime scene report almost. And then some people um, are just transported back there and it can be very emotional for them. Uh, and then, you know, in a lot of ways, it's also very, um, cleansing to get it out and, and be able to tell a story you know, like, like we kind of talked about before and um, letting those emotions out can be helpful as well. Mm. One of the other strange stories I, I want to touch on is this wonderful story that's come from Rio de Janeiro, John, which which sh shows the, the international reach of, of your work and the paranormal in general, because I think it's amazing when you look at certain encounters or certain stories from your home country, perhaps, and you think, oh, well, you know, I expect to have a haunted theatre here and there. And, and, you know, you can't move for haunted pubs in the UK. And I, I would imagine most theatres in London claim to have a ghost of some description, even a ghost cat in one of them. So to hit, see and hear this incredible story about uh, a young lady who ends up getting a cleaning job at the Grand Opera House in Rio... Um, <laughs> and it's one of those where where you it's it's the kind of people just get on with things that um, <laughs> despite the ghost's best intention, she needs the job more than she's bothered about the ghost. <laughs> right, exactly, and it's it's fascinating too. So Clara, you know, got me the story, and I was able to talk to her. And you know, in in the eighties, early eighties, um, she was around eighteen years old, and she'd actually grown up, you know, in a, actually a small village kind of area in Brazil. But um, she had moved to Rio de Janeiro because she wanted to go to school. And um, at the time, Brazil was, you know, really they were doing a push to get, especially women you know, through education and everything. And it was a great time for her to get an education, but she still needed, obviously she still needed money and not coming from any money whatsoever. She needed a job and she was able to find one doing early morning cleanings at the, the grand opera house in Rio de Janeiro. And, uh, she had to get up early at four o'clock and get on the bus and and get in you know and then there was a, a crew um i think there, there was about there was eight of them on her crew and they would clean till about 10 a.m and the one of the first times that she ran into a ghost i believe you know she was cleaning and what or one of the main ones she was cleaning on a little step cleaning uh, along the edge and 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 cleaning some of the the frames and this uh uh this gentleman just showed up and, you know, he was dressed all nice and but his suit was very old and um, he kind of was staring at what she was doing. And he was in his, you know, 50s, thin mustache and an old style suit. And he just kind of gave her a tisk tisk kind of just didn't approve of how she was cleaning. And then he just kind of turned and walked away and then <laughs> vanished. And she's like, what? Because, you know, he there, it wasn't even one of those, you know, kind of things at the beginning. He, he looked like he was just a regular guy standing there until he turned and, and vanished. And she was really upset and ran to the, the lady that was in charge. 
And she took her into, you know, a closed room and said, you know, yeah, the, the, this place is haunted and we're not allowed to, do it. which, you know, is, it's kind of scary for somebody, especially that age, you know, you're, you're stepping out, you're trying to do scary things as it is, you know, to go to school and, and move to the big city. And now all of a sudden you're thrown into, uh, cleaning a place that's obviously haunted, but, um, it took her a little while. Um, she was would see that gentleman every once in a while. They had a nickname for him, the Fancy Man, which um, <laughs> they believed he was uh, one of the one of the general managers or something from back in the 30s that had taken his job so seriously he was still doing it, and he he didn't appreciate the way things were being cleaned or something. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> she she talked about a couple of the ghosts that she ran into, one that they called the Red Woman. Um, and she was always come out and, you know, appear from closed door. And, um, he, she, she had on, uh, he was on knees, um, a little red dress and a hat and was always really upset about something. Always, you know, crying or, or just something, you know, very upsetting about who she was. And she would come out of one door and end up going in another. And what was funny is, um, there was, uh, uh, I believe a rose, um, rose water, um, smell and cigarette smell that, that would follow her as well. And so she kind of got a little bit used to, I, as much as you can, I guess, used to running into these ghosts every one, every so often. But she had one incident that was extremely, she said, extremely scary. Um, they were finishing up for the day, but she had forgot, um, she forgot something on the, back bottom backstage there was a hallway there she had to run and get it and she was in the back area and all of a sudden um it was she had left a bucket or something back there and all of the steps in the hallway and this little tiny it was a small hallway back behind the stage and it started running at her really hard, fast and hard down there and she couldn't anything she grew the bucket and she slipped and fell and um then the steps ran right up to her and even though she couldn't see anything there was a man's voice that yelled at her go you know a growly voice telling her to go and so she scooped up and and headed out you know and met the girl as she was bawling and just really upset obviously and mm. um but she refused to go in after that which i don't blame her whatsoever but that was her scariest experience that she worked there. But yeah, she had run into several of us um, over the years of cleaning. And uh, she talked a little bit about kind of how she'd not only come to accept them, but, um, you know, work. It's, you know, interesting. It happens with a lot of people that work in areas like that. But it was um, it was exciting for her. Um, well, it was actually exciting for me to get a story from Brazil. And uh, the connections there and to realize, you know, all, all the way around the world, you know, very similar things happen to people. And when it comes to ghosts or um, different things like that, and it's uh, like I said that she she was told not to talk about it. But many years later, she felt OK about it. But it's kind of a, a cool story, an international story, like you say, which I love. Yeah, I always love a critical ghost, John, as well. I mean, it's, it's bad enough to see a ghost, but one that's thinking that you're not very good at cleaning, I think, is, is even is even worse. I mean, come on, you, you've terrified the poor girl. You don't need to criticise her dusting, for God's sake. What's wrong with her? <laughs> yes, exactly. And uh, it was funny that, that that ghost, his main thing was to would show up when things weren't being done right and and just kind of, you know, browbeat them, not say anything. But, uh, yeah, I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> uh, oh. I was just going to say that kind of illustrates something uh, that I, it's something that I illustrate to people all the time is that running into a ghost is just like running into somebody on the street. You're going to run into 10 people on the street you know, nine out of the 10 are going to be fairly decent people. It's that 10th person that's just really mean and ornery. And if they were mean and ornery in real life, they're going to be mean and ornery in the next life. So, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Even even yeah. ghosts can be bad tempered. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Well, I think the last one I want to touch on is, is one of my favourite subjects. And it's always nice to see a new witness regaling us with a story of this, John. And it's it's an encounter from New Brunswick with two friends going for a hike who unfortunately run across the infamous and legendary Wendigo. Oh, yes. Um, this one was I, – and I love the fact that I got this story as well because – because the gentleman, in, you know, in this that told me the story, he is not um, one of the First Nations people, but his mm. friend that and family um, are, <clears throat> and so it was. It was kind of an, an interesting sneak peek into, you know, their beliefs and, and a little bit of the things going on there, um, because honestly, it sometimes it's very hard to get those stories from the First Nations people or um, from uh, uh, Native Americans just because it is so I, I'm, I'm not going to say it's not taboo. It's just, you know, they, the their belief in, you know, you don't talk about it because it'll show up. So but mm. yeah. So Jimmy um, had grown up um, in New Brunswick and he had lost his dad. Um, when he was very young, but his dad and him had a connection through fly fishing. And later on, uh, when he was 12, he lost his dad. And later on, he met Alex in school when he was around 14. And Alex was um, for he was from um, one of the Native Americans. He was First Nations and um, they actually bonded over fishing as well. And he was just kind of accepted into Alex's family, and they would spend a lot of time fishing and just doing a lot of things with his family, and, and they kind of adopted him into their family. And when they were 17, they planned this fishing trip, and Alex's grandfather had told them, you know, uh, you know, this is a great place to fish, but you just fish it during the day. You're gone long time before sunset. And they're like, uh, okay. But, and they kind of brushed off what Alex's grand, grandfather had said. And they're like, we're going to go camp there and we're going to spend all this time fishing and because it's so far away. And so <clears throat> they got up there on this river and set up um, their camp and then got in the river and, and started fishing. And for those of you out there that know, um, I'm, I, I'm a fisherman as well, and I know time flies when you're in the river and you're fishing, especially when you're fly fishing. And they kept fishing and fishing before long. It was starting to get dark. And mm -hmm. um, they uh, they kept signaling each other, you know, one more cast, let's go a little bit. And finally it was getting really dark. And so they uh, waited back, but, you know, um, he noticed the Alex and, and creepy vibe going on. You know, they just were not feeling it. There was something not right. So they finally said, Let, you know, let's head back to camp. Um, and they would we waited up the river. So they got out and they got on the trail and started back towards camp. And um, they were walking and there's just this really heavy feeling in the air. You know, and the the animals are, and the crickets have all stopped talking, which in you know is a, never a good sign. From everything that I've ever experienced or seen or heard, that's not a good sign. But uh, he was following Alex, and Alex just stopped, and he's like, "It's so quiet out here," you know. And they're like, "Yeah, it's it's really creepy." And they kept walking, and if you for those of you that know, don't know when you're very noisy. And um, so they'd gone about, they would got to within about meters of camp or so. And he sees something and grabs Alex. Um, and there was a species watching them. And it was really kind of easy to see because it was, it, it, the figure stood out from the darkness of the trees and it was so pale. Um, it, when they explained it, it was almost something out of uh, the walking dead with, basically a skeleton with skin hanging off of it just just like pale and um had ragged pants on it just looked like mm. a zombie you know what you would think mm. of as a zombie yeah. and um long black stringy hair and so they take off running for the truck as fast as they can <clears throat> they 
they, it's it starts chasing them. They get to the car, they throw their stuff in. Uh, you know, they can hear what one thing that stood out to me too telling this story is that you can hear it behind them, and it sounded. I mean, its breath sounds really gross, ragged breathing. And later mm. on in life, he recognized that as a death rattle. Um, when yeah. people are dying, they get what's called a death rattle. And it was close enough that they could hear that, but they they um, got to the truck, threw their stuff, you know, took off, left their camp, obviously upset. <laughs> <laughs> and Alex um, kept just saying the words Wendigo, Wendigo, and he's like, he didn't know what that was. When they finally got to where they could, you know, pull off and talk, and he just told him it was a wind, um, briefly explained what that was. It wasn't until much later he he learned what it was which is for those of you that don't know it's a spirit it's something that's created a spirit or something that's created when somebody turns to cannibalism and it's a creature just wanders the woods trying to eat anything it can but it can never fill its body it's always hungry and that comes from when somebody has turned to cannibalism and that's a basic exp- explanation of it what was funny is that when Alex's grandfather found out that they had done exactly, you know, he chastised them and told them they were lucky to be alive. And and so it was um, it's it was really kind of a cool story from my perspective. As it was not cool, but uh, to, <laughs> especially from kind of a First Nations um, perspective and and that creature and of whatever it is for sure. So, yeah, it's fast. Like you say, I think it's. When you come across stories like this, as you say, because of the the sort of protection that the the tribes and the First Nations have over these particular encounters, and I think I think when for someone like yourself, John, I would imagine you you feel a little bit honoured when you get a sort of insight into these kind of stories or beliefs, especially when it comes to the tribes or the the First Nations, where as as you say, we don't really get a, an insight to that because a lot of these experiences that they've shared in the past they've been poo-pooed and and dismissed as just folklore or tall tales or 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 just silly nonsense to be brutally honest that that people just don't take them seriously and so for a lot of us that are really interested and have and have an interest in this they're really hard to track down unless you can kind of make that connection or or build that respect and trust with people from that background that they're willing to be open to you about this. So I would imagine you were quite excited when you got it. Yes, I was. Yep. And and it's just amazing to me um, when I do finally, you know, find somebody that was from the first friends that are okay to, to share with me. I just feel very humbled by that because like you say, it's, it's, there is just it, the way it is. Every, it's very sad. Um, so yeah, it, it's, not only exciting, but was very, like you say, humbling to get this. Um, I know that because of the past and everything that's going on, you know, a lot of people are afraid to share, especially what is their religion is, you know, with with that. So mm. it really was humbling. Mm. Well, it's a, it's another wonderful collection of experiences and, and witnesses coming forward to share these stories with you, John. Where can everybody track your work down, get hold of this book and your numerous other titles to uh, give themselves some spooky reading material as we head into the uh, scariest of months? <laughs> yes. So all of the books under uh, Stranger Bridgerland book series on Amazon, they are available on Kindle and Softback as well. And you can also reach me or find out books at Stranger Bridgerland. Dot com and on there my wife and I do just a little part of that where we talk about difference like this as well and it's the Stranger Bridgerland podcast and you can also find that on the website or anywhere that it is as well uh, that you can find podcasts and uh, if any of your viewers would love to share a story with me um, again go to Stranger Bridgerland dot their stories and and talk to them and you can find out where I'm going to go I, I especially this time of year where it's spooky season I get to go out and um, for universities and libraries they have been uh, usually have a list of the website so fantastic well john it's been a real pleasure to finally get a chance to speak with you i hope it's not our last conversation and i wish you all the very best with the latest book already as we said at the beginning it's doing fantastically well and uh, long may your collating and collection of such wonderful stories from around the world continue and i wish you the very best and i look forward to our next chat yes anytime i would love to come back and thank you again so much for having me on 